Welcome everyone to part two of Alberta Explorers Evening, uh, exploring our fine province virtually um, through the eyes of various authors in Alberta. It's been a very great evening so far and I'm very excited about this part two session with Chris Fisher and Dale Leckie. Before we get started, I want to do a quick land acknowledgement. Today is Truth and Reconciliation Day and that is a very historic thing for Canada. Uh, I am coming to you from Treaty 7 lands. I'm in Canmore, Alberta. And in the spirit of respect, recipro reciprocity, and truth, I honor and acknowledge the Canmore area known as Chihuachin Chin Kudie, uh, Kudie B, sorry, translated in Stony Nakoda as shooting at the willows, and the traditional Treaty 7 territory and oral practices of the Yarhe. Nakoda, the Stony Nakoda, comprised of the Bearspaw, Chiniki, Wesley First Nations, as well as, as well as the Sutina First Nation and the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprised of the Siksika, Pikani, and Kainai. I acknowledge that this territory is home to the Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3 within the historical Northwest Métis homeland. I acknowledge all nations who live, work, and play and help us steward this land and honor and celebrate this territory. Today and all days, I feel immense gratitude for all of the stewards of the land that came before me and enabled me to live the life that I live. And I encourage you now to just take a moment to mentally, in your own mind, uh, acknowledge the treaty lands that you may be on. So without further ado, I'll introduce our two amazing uh, speakers and authors for the evening. Chris Fisher is a best-selling author, filmmaker, and television host. I mean, he really gets around. Uh, Chris has a diverse portfolio of accomplishments, including Birds of Alberta, one of the best-selling books ever published in Alberta. And if you don't have a copy, why? You should go out and buy it. Like, it has to be on your bookcase. Other titles include Mammals of Alberta, Reptiles and Amphibians of Canada, Birds of New York City. He has also written extensively for Alberta education resources and documentary films featured on The Nature of Things with David Suzuki, Discovery Channel, and Animal Planet. Television credits include co-writer of the long-running series Acorn the Nature Nut, which just like really takes me back <laughs> to a few years ago for sure, and as a writer and host of Wild Files TV, a 13-episode TV children's series. And if you want to know more about Chris and his great work, he has a website, chrisfisher.ca. I'll throw that in the chat. Dale Leckie, PhD, is a geologist who worked at the Geological Survey of Canada and is chief geologist in a large Canadian energy company. He has edited numerous books and published widely on the geology of Western Canada. He's an adjunct prof professor at the Geoscience Department at the University of Calgary. Dale's first book, Rocks, Ridges, and Rivers, Geological Wonders of Banff, Yoho, and Jasper National Parks, was a highly successful Calgary and Edmonton bestseller. The Scenic Geology of Alberta has been on the Calgary, Edmonton, and Lethbridge bestseller list consistently since its publication in May 2021. And I believe it because Alberta has amazing geology, and I can't wait for you to tell us all about it, Dale. Dale Leckie guides you to Alberta's most scenic sites with intriguing stories of Alberta's landscape evolution. Welcome, Chris and Dale. Thank you so much. I'm excited about learning about the interface of wildlife and geology. So, Dale, I think you are going to start. Just think, as you're sitting there watching this presentation about all the Alberta landscapes that you know, think about the rugged mountains, Waterton, Jasper, Banff, Kananaskis country, and then think about the foothills. They're not quite as rugged, but they're pretty spectacular. Then go a little bit further east or far east, and you go into the prairies, and you see badland terrain. You see a very different landscape. Then go north. Go north into the boreal forest, where most of, most of the landscape, not all, is, is covered by large trees, conifers and deciduous trees, uh, the boreal forest. So just think about that. And think how diverse that landscape is. Think of the processes that operate there. Extreme temperatures, extreme aridity, extreme rainfall events, thick snows. That's got to affect the wildlife that lives there. And that's what Chris and I are going to talk about today. We're going to look at landscape. It's not going to be a lot of imagery. We're going to have a free discussion about the landscape 
um, and, it's, and, and how it formed and what the animals that lived there. And you can make your own conclusions at the end, whether landscape is, the geology in the landscape is controlling um, the animal distribution. I'm pretty convinced since Chris, Chris and I started communicating a month and a half, two months ago about this, I've been getting more and more excited about that relationship. So I wrote the book, The Scenic Geology of Alberta, a roadside touring and hiking guide. So I take people to look at the geology of the province. Now, we're not going to talk technical it here at all. We're just going to look at landscapes. Um, and Chris will interject when I show some of the animal shots. So here we've got rugged mountains in Waterton Lakes National Park. And living there, Chris, well, we just heard about grizzly bears in the previous session and wouldn't be able to talk about Alberta wildlife without mentioning grizzly bears, of course, one of the most iconic species in the entire world. And certainly we're fortunate to share the landscapes with them. And what I like to say about grizzly bears is that when you are in grizzly country, no matter how imposing the geology and the strata is, always in the back of your mind, you're thinking grizzly bears and what fortune we have to share the landscapes with them. And who are the grizzlies sharing the landscape with? Well, a whole bunch of other things, but um, elk, of course, previous, like grizzly bears, previously occupied most of the province, um, you know, since uh, Europeans showed up, the ranges shrunk to the areas that we kind of conceive of them as, you know, in the national parks, in the, the mountains, and in places like Elk Island. But just like the grizzly bear, which is now reoccupying some of those areas of its former range, elk, certainly, they're center is in our um, our mountains and foothills but we're finding them out on the open prairie near Jenner, alberta um, around medicine hat the cypress hills you know you're probably in if you're living in alberta you're probably no more than an hour or two away from an elk breathing right now <laughs> um alberta was covered by up to four kilometers of ice during the last glaciation only twenty thousand years ago the ice melted all sorts of terrain was created. And we have knob and kettle terrain. And the name doesn't matter, but knobs and kettles, potholes and shallow hills. And that's got to have an influence on some of the wildlife. Hey, those look familiar. Yeah, these are, of course, these are, I think this is from a tweet celebrating brown ducks. You know, we have extraordinarily colorful ducks, but let's give some credit to some brown ducks as well. We've got some redheads here, which without redheads and some teals, uh, these are female ducks. And we want to give them a little bit of credit because oftentimes they're overlooked, but they, are, they don't overlook the Alberta landscape. Uh, in many of these areas, the knob and kettle terrains, there's so many little potholes that it's the breeding factory of ducks for the entire North American continent. That's why we so see organizations like Ducks Unlimited um, putting so much money into these areas and helping out the conservation cause locally. I was really hoping you'd say breeding factory of these ducks because that's that little line or phrase caught in my mind. So well, it won't be the last buzzword I throw out there, uh, whether they make sense or not. I don't have one for a leopard frog though, um, but um, certainly we have good numbers of amphibians. Um, northern leopard frogs tend to be found in the southern part of the province in Oxbow Lakes. And we'll probably talk a little bit about the formation of our major prairie rivers and how they're constantly changing, constantly winding and unwinding and creating habitat for all kinds of species and including northern leopard frogs in some of these backwater channels. So you leave the mountains, you leave the knob and kettle terrain, and you go into the prairies, eastern Alberta, south and eastern Alberta, and it, it, it's a badland terrain. And here's canyon badlands that we see in Milk River Canyon. And I truly think this is one of the most spectacular sites we've got in Alberta. And I, many people have heard me say, I think it rivals the Icefields Parkway, um, especially on a blue sky day. And there, what do we see? Uh, we see rattlesnakes, and I did see rattlesnakes the last time I paddled the Milk River Canyon back in the 90s. And back then, folks, you could actually put your canoe in, in the Milk River at the Aden Bridge in southern Alberta and take it out at the Grey Tech Ranch in the United States, in Montana. Well, you can't do that anymore, so I guess I'm old enough to have had that experience. But of course, since 9-11, there ain't no way you were paddling across that area. And it's very remote, very difficult to get to. But the rewards in that area for rattlesnakes and lizards, and there's a, there's a mountain shorthorn lizard in that kind of area, 
Um, and of course, yucca plants. Uh, and of course, the landscape is, and painted turtles in that area as well. Uh, marvelous, marvelous landscapes. And we'll probably talk a little bit about the formation. Oyster beds, like ancient, ancient oyster beds down in those areas as well. Phenomenal things. It's just, it is a pretty amazing, both that geology you mentioned, as well as that wildlife. It's so unique there. Then continuing the Badlands theme, you go to Dinosaur Provincial Park and you've got Badlands and Scablands and the details don't matter, but Badlands are different from Scablands and it's giving you this spectacular terrain. Yes, there's the dinosaurs there, but it's such a phenomenal, phenomenal terrain. And there you might find well, this is a young Swainson's hawk. We're seeing quite a few of these now, not only in dinosaur, but throughout the southern half of the province. So as you drive around this weekend uh, and you see a, a drabish looking hawk, see how long its wing, wing tips are there. They extend beyond the tail tip. So even if they are not as dramatically plumaged as the adult versions, you can be identifying these Swainson's hawks. They're going adios right away. They're heading off to um, Argentina on the Pampas which for those of us who have been fortunate to visit Chile and Argentina, these landscapes are not too different. It's a long, long flight, dangerous flight through the Isthmus of Panama and the tropical rainforests of Brazil. But once they get there, it's not quite like their birthplace, but there's some familiarity in there as well. Oops. So traveling around Alberta and there used to be glacial lakes, lakes, lakes formed right up against the ice. And they drained, that sand became sand dunes. And we can see that in several spots across the province, situations like that, south and north. And sometimes there. Well, Ord's kangaroo rat, which is uh, one of the most endangered species in all of Canada. They occur in a small area about an hour north of Medicine Hat and in Suffield Military Range. And I've been fortunate to work on them. And they are incredibly tied to loose, sandy soils. Um, when we were finding them, we'd be walking along and it's just a little minor ridge that may be elevated a meter above the surrounding landscape, but they, their dens are perfectly aligned in these little clusters of remaining sand dunes. So I'm looking forward to maybe having a more thorough discussion on these because they are so closely, a, a soil scientist could map out the distribution of these critters in the province of Alberta so closely they are tied to the substrate in which they are dependent on. You go, you, we're going to talk about rivers, river environments around the province. And here's the Red Deer River Valley. And it creates a rather unique um, ecosystem in which both the plants as well as the animals th that live there, it creates phenomenal habitat. And it's all related to the geology and to the geomorphology. Yeah, these floodplains are just phenomenal. I, I recognize that slide. That has got to be Dinosaur Provincial Park, one of the greatest floodplains with a mass of cottonwood trees where you see common nighthawks above your tent, um, perching silently during the daylight hours. And then as soon as that sun begins to dip behind the coolies, meh, meh. Yeah. And you look above and the nighthawks start displaying. And it is one of the great summer evening activities to watch diving nighthawks as they perform their portrait rituals above your head in Dinosaur Provincial Park. Elsewhere um, during the day, all those little shrubs and bushes and willows are alive with probably the highest density of songbirds and mule deer um, in, that we have in Alberta. It's just alive and it's just the rich landscape that is dependent on the deposit every so often the regular deposit of these rich sediments coming downstream. I guess I might have mislabeled that. I said, I called it a white. Oh, that, that is a white tail. Look at the scrawny ears. I was busy uh, waving my hand. Oh, sorry. I just, I, slides. Yeah. And all these photos, the, the animal and the bird photos are all Chris's, just so everybody knows. Um, mountains, rivers, they get it, they erode. And, but mostly, most specifically here in the mountains, we get rock falls and we get rock slides. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that. Um, here is Kananaska Provincial Park, which the sign calls it a rock glacier, but it's not really a rock glacier, it's something else. But that's a different story. But there, this guy was, uh, he was photographed next door um, at Parmigan Cirque, I believe, or Arethusa, but they're all there. This is of course a pika, call it a pika if you want, but they kind of sound like peaks. Um, and um, they are, of course, very closely tied. And I think we'll, once we're finished with the images, we'll, we'll kind of go into greater detail about yeah. pikas and rock slides. 
because it is just such a, and, and there's marmots, there's, this is a yellow-bellied marmot that's uh, found in Lumbrick Falls area and up in the Porcupine Hills, close to the uh, Hit Smashed in Buffalo Jump is an excellent place. Also the Milk River Canyon. Um, their counterpart up in the high elevation mountains is a hoary marmot. So they're the whistlers, they're the um, one that we hear um, uh, on Whistler Mountain in Jasper and, and places like um, wherever you see big rocks. Uh, I do. They're, they're sunning themselves up there. And I do recognize those sandstones as coming from Lundbrook Falls, like yeah. you said. And I mislabeled that marmot, but I'll live with it. Um, <laughs> you go north, you go to the boreal uplands, and you go to, to per, for perhaps Swan Hills. And Swan Hills is capped by an ancient river gravel. But that's another story as well. But in the boreal uplands, you may find something like this. Oh, yeah. Those were photographed uh, not far from the Swan Hills this year up near Fox Creek Grand Prairie. And this is young sawwet owls. And that boreal landscape, um, relatively flat um, for most of it, the plains, rich soils, you get this dense forest that is that, that, that just comes alive for a very short period of time with migrant birds and non-migrant birds. And sawwet owls, these young ones, they're kind of a mix of migrant and locals. They'll undergo short distant migrations out of the boreal down to uh, areas of Southern Alberta, the Northern United States. But it is such a densely populated area for bird life. Um, and these birds, you know, they leave Colombia and Peru <laughs> and Costa Rica to come up to these areas of Northern Alberta to breed. So their passport says Alberta on it if they would be such thing, even though they probably would speak Spanish because they spend most of their life down in South and Central America. But these areas are so vitally important for these neotropical migrants. And that's such a great photo. So it gives you a flavor of the landscapes that we've got across Alberta and the diversity of the species, the animal species, uh, the bird, as, as well as the mammalian and the reptilian species that live there. And that's what Chris and I are gonna talk about. I didn't have any pictures of Chris's books, but in the communications that Lynn has sent to you, they're all listed and they're all shown there. So I'd recommend you pick them up there. Some are still in print, some are in their 16th or the 20th edition. Um, I'd like to, from the scenic geology of Alberta perspective, I'd like to acknowledge the Canadian Geological Foundation who provided funding for me to print it. And I'd also like to um, acknowledge the Alberta government uh, who provided a grant to print the book. So thank you very much to both of those agencies. So that was the slides to give you a flavor of Alberta. Um, and stop to share. There we go. So it's over to you, Chris. Well, let's start off with a bang. And probably the biggest bang, whether it's geology or wildlife in the province, is these rock slides. So as we touched on, you know, places like Rock Glacier um, in Kananaskis, um, you know, various places throughout the areas. If you do any hiking, and in fact, prior to this Zoom call, we had a quick one a couple of days ago when Sarah shared a story about hiking in Table Mountain and Castle. And that was the very first, very first mountain I ever climbed as a 10-year-old kid. There's a little summer camp down there that I went to. And it was on that hike, as it has happened so many times to people who go into our, our, our Rocky Mountains, I heard a Pika for the first time. And of course, you're up in high elevation, you're getting a little tired. So you want to take these times to stop and take a rest. And the pikas and the golden mantle ground squirrels and the hoary marmots emerge from this tangle of rock, these talus rocks. And they provide such an interesting diversion for hikers who experience our backcountry in the mountains. And they are only found in these rock slide areas. You go 100 meters into the forest, um, they occasionally may run in there to, to grab some grass, but they are so closely tied to, to these very isolated, very hazardous, very dangerous, very, very short-lived. I don't know, tell us more about the longevity of these, the hazards. I mean, this is a crazy ephemeral so, geology in a lot of ways. So both of them, I think two examples that you could visit to see where the pikas live and occur. One is it was instantaneous. It was the Frank Slide, 1903. The Frank Slide took place in the Crow's Nest Pass. And on middle of the night, it came down and destroyed most of the town or half of the town of Frank, killed more than 90 people. But from our perspective, it created this topography 
irregular topography. It's got these giant blocks, these small blocks of limestone. And the, the, the slide, we don't know exactly why it occurred. There's probably half a dozen reasons. It's all geological processes, mountain building, where you get thrusting, the rocks were bent and folded over in one another, making them weaker. Um, it was just such an unstable area. And then multiple glaciations over the last couple of million years steepened that slope. What triggered it? There's all sorts of stories and theories about that. Was it the coal miners? Was it freeze thaw action? Was it rainfall? Doesn't matter. It happened and it was disastrous. And that's one of the environments. And that was instantaneous, how that one formed. The other one, and we've mentioned it now, Rock Glacier in Kananaskis country. Well, that one takes thousands of years, or that environment took thousands of years to form. It, it, the, the, what I find interesting is the sign on the side of the road at Rock Glacier calls it Rock Glacier. But the engineers, the civil engineers went in there and they studied it. And they said, this isn't a Rock Glacier. It is what we call, meaning the civil engineers call, a topple. I love that name, T-O-P-P-L-E. And so a topple is just what the name sounds, just rocks would fall over. Freeze thaw action forces sedimentary beds apart, they become unstable and they fail. Sometimes there's snow avalanches that brings debris down. And every time that happens in that environment, we get talus coming down. We get rocks stacking up one on top of another with spaces between them. And between those spaces is just the ideal habitat for the pika to live. There's enough fine grain material that comes down and works its way through the little pore holes in the rocks that we get soil forming and the soil is where the vegetation grows. And Chris's picture that we showed, showed one of the pika with some of the grass or some of the vegetation that it had in its mouth. So that kind of sets the stage for the pika habitat. Chris. Yeah, with all that sort of stuff, one of the, the things that I realized when I used to, to work in glaciated country is how long soil formation takes. I mean, it's not an instantaneous thing. So what you may say is because of the the violence that happens with these events, there's probably a lot of dust that's created as well. And would that promote quicker soil formation than in, you know, it, let's, let's say a, 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 a landscape where a glacier is retreating and, you know, just hard rock is being exposed. That takes centuries sometimes for grass to take hold. So in, in a, you know, a talus landscape, perhaps a, the, the grasses can take hold quicker. Yep. And so, you know, every time it rains or when there's snow melt, there's always fine debris that makes its way through the holes in the rocks. And that fine debris finds little low lying areas where it can accumulate. And that's what becomes the soil on which that vegetation, the mosses and the shrubs and the alpine vegetation starts to grow. And that's what the peak is harvesting, right? Well, that's right. And, and certainly in these areas, because they're relatively small, they're bordered by vegetation. So, through wind and other means, um, they would get seeded pretty quickly. And we yeah. talked about really small material. I want to talk for a minute about really big material. Um, one of my favorite peak and hoary marmot locations is Mount Edith Cavell. And there's a very big rock that came from that area. And well, I think today is actually a pretty good day to talk about that particular big, big, big rock that's very famous. And that'll lead us into um, some erratic discussion, I think. Yeah, I think that's really a good lead into that. So Mount Edith Cavell, it's such a pretty and beautiful place. And then, there, the, and then it all leads to the big rock, the Okotoks erratic. Um, and o the Okotoks erratic originated from Mount Edith Cavell in Jasper National Park. So during the maximum of the last glaciation, 20, I'm going to generalize 20,000 years ago, there were two ice masses. There was the, the Cordilleran coming from the mountains, ice mass, and there was the giant Laurentide ice sheet. The giant ice sheet was up to four kilometers thick. There was an avalanche on Mount Edith Cavell, and it deposited debris onto one of the valley glaciers. That valley glaciers carried those probably hundreds of millions of tons of material out onto the Athabasca Glacier, into Hinton, and then that valley glacier bump, jump, bumped into the giant Laurentide ice sheet. It didn't have anywhere to go, but it was buttressed and forced to go south. All so it couldn't, it couldn't kick out to the east? It couldn't go east because that other one was just so big. And so it flowed 
almost where the Rocky, the edge of the Rocky Mountain foothills are, um, all the way down to Montana. So we find these giant rocks, small rocks, big rocks, in between size rocks that originated from Mount Edith Cavell. And they're spread across a trend that's a kilometer to 20 kilometers wide. And the most famous one is Big Rock, Okotok. And you, you mentioned the, the appropriateness of talking about Okotok today. Um, and on, on the written, no, for where we're honoring, it's not honoring, where we're respecting and remembering past transgressions. Well, Okotok is Blackfoot word for rock or big rock. And the, another theory, idea on the origin of Okotok is to do with a creation story that the First Nations people um, have proposed how it got there. It was Nappy, the creator. He was creating the earth. He was carrying his buffalo robe. And this story was related by one of the, one of the elders. And so that's where it comes from. He was carrying his buffalo robe. It got too hot. So he was traveling with coyote or with, with uh, the coyote. He asked coyote, would you look after, sorry, I just see a chat that popped up. He, he asked coyote to, um, no, what do you do? So he went to Big Rock and said, take my coat. I don't want it. Here is a gift. Coyote um, traveling with Nappy um, sort of accompanied him on his adventures. Later it got cold. And when it got cold, Nappy wanted his robe back. He went, he had coyote, go to Big Rock, Okotok, and ask for his robe back. And no, I don't want to give it to you. It was a gift. Um, and then from that, uh, Nappy stole it or took back his robe. The story continues on from there. Um, Okotok started chasing Nappy, and Nappy got help from various animals. Some of the animals came to his assistance. Uh, the bats, for instance, they tried to stop Big Rock or Okotok. They crashed into it and they broke pieces of it off, but they couldn't stop them. Uh, but they flattened the fronts of their noses. And that's why bats today have flat noses. So the story continues. Uh, but I think it, it's a very appropriate one to talk about today, Chris. Well, absolutely. And there's there's other very significant uh, large boulders um, that are found typically in the prairies. I believe they're called rib stones and, and others, and, and some have uh, an extraordinary cultural value. Um, as a wildlife guy, the cool thing about those is, you know, if you're an itchy bison, and boy, there were a lot of itchy bison running around southern Alberta for many, many uh, well, centuries, there was no trees around, there was no barbed wire fence around, so they would scratch on these large boulders. And, and the cool thing about it is if you go down, I'm sure Dale could relate, so many of these boulders, unfortunately, are on private land, so they don't have great access to them. If, if uh, Dale knows of some in public areas, he can certainly share that with us. But so you end up having these polished edges on the sides of these large boulders that are rubbed um, smooth by generations and generations of bison. And not only that, because they keep walking around the base of these boulders, the, the soil there blows away because it's, it's rendered into dust. And the boulder begins to settle in a divot of its own creation. And then when the spring's rains come, it pools a little ephemeral pond. And then you end up getting things like spadefoot toads, which are just these explosive breeders that hang out in the prairies and they just hit every puddle of water for a couple of weeks in order to see this happen. So, you know, from these great cultural artifacts to these natural history and geological artifacts, there's, there's a lot of a lot of neat stuff from big rocks on the prairies. Well, there is, and you know, th this spring, my wife and I went camping in Grasslands National Park in Southern Saskatchewan. We actually left Alberta. And one of the interesting things, the reason I bring that there, bring that up is the bison have been reintroduced recently to that park. And one of the highlights of the trip was watching the bison rubbing themselves up against all the big erratics that were there, just like you're talking about. So if you want to go see some of these erratics that, that have been rubbed by the bison. Um, there's lots in Calgary. Nose Hill has some. There's Head Smashed In Buffalo Jump, about a kilometer and a half away from Head Smashed In Buffalo Jump is a rock, a giant rock that came from Mount Edith Cavell. There is the pit around it that Chris just mentioned, and it's been smoothed on the bottom part. 
So they're all over the province. We're lucky to have a few places you can find them. Don't trespass. That particular rock I photographed it, that is the westernmost range of spadefoot toads in the province. So if you hit it right, you could hit spadefoots um, in there. Now, since, since we're on the prairies, let's talk a little bit about prairie rivers. I, I mean, I'm, I was born in Lethbridge, so I really have a, a, a great appreciation for the prairie landscapes and have worked a great deal in the prairie landscapes. And we're talking, of course, about the South Saskatchewan River, the Red Deer River, the Bow River, the Old Man River, uh, the Milk River, certainly. And um, when you drop down, um, from the flat plains into them, it, even to this day, it, it takes my breath away. As a, as a wildlife person, um, if you'd look at the distribution of certain species like golden eagles, um, which require cliff faces, um, rattlesnakes, who, which require areas, well, they're going right now to spend the winter in dens, and their dens are almost always on the rims of these southern prairie um, rivers and and Dale will explain what those features are but they need to get underground because it gets really cold down there and they got to get down you know a couple of meters and they can't dig their way down so they either rely on geological forces that are present in the area or sometimes a, a convenient badger but most time the big dens are these crevices that are created by the very active geology in these areas so that's really interesting because the areas you've just talked about um, where the snakes live, it's in our badlands. It's, 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 it's in the mauvais terrain, which the Lavarandres called it in the late 1700s, badlands. It's just French. My, my French is horrible. But that's when they first described it. You couldn't travel across it. Difficult to travel across. It's no good for, um, for uh, agriculture. But that badlands terrain one of the characteristics of badlands terrain is how quickly it erodes. So when we get big rainstorms, thunderstorms, typical of the prairies, um, you can get horrendous thunderstorms with a lot of rain. And we can get up to half a centimeter, 0.4 millimeters, 0.5, sorry, point, half a centimeter. We'll call it of erosion, vertically and laterally. The water runs off and it starts to create um, gullies, in, in rills, but then it also starts to create pipes. And those pipes are hollow little caves or tunnels. Those are ideal spots for a lot of these snakes to live. The other thing about this landscape, and to give you the irregular topography that we've got within these valleys, I want you to think back what I said a few minutes ago. Alberta was covered by kilometers of ice. Northern Alberta, four kilometers. Calgary, kilometer and a half of ice. That's a lot of ice, that's a lot of weight. And, and, and when the ice melted, the prairies lifted up. Ice, we call it isostatically. It's just like um, an ice cube or an iceberg. The top of it melts and the ice cube rises. That's what happened across the prairies. And then we had the glaciers pulling back. There were deep meltwater channels cut by glacial lakes that became abandoned. But the landscape's rising. And the rivers, the North Saskatchewan, the Red Deer, the Old Man, they are cutting down into that deep landscape. And rivers meander from one side to the other. They deposit on one side of, their, of, of the river course, they erode on the other side. Where they erode, the banks become unstable. And as a result, you get lands, uh, rock slides, landslides occurring. And those landslides create irregular topography, which the snakes can live in and survive as well. Well, absolutely. Yeah. And, and without them, the, the snakes would not exist. And if you look at the distribution map, they're actually all the dens, you know, they can't go more than three, four kilometers from each of these dens. So if you destroy some of these dens and the dens, are, of course, are slipping away on occasion and new ones are being created. So it's a very dynamic landscape. Well, let's, uh, we're having a great time here chatting, but we need to cover more of the province. Let's head up north just a little bit and and visit some of these areas of, of, of Knob and Kettle and, and some of the larger hills a little bit further and closer to Edmonton for those of us tuning in from, from Edmonton. You know, there are places like Elk Island National Park, which, you know, when I lived in Edmonton, I'd visit quite a bit. And if you notice as you're driving out there, you, you're gaining, it's not like driving a bath where it's very noticeable elevation, but you're going up the entire time. And once you get up there, of course, it's all very forested, it's not farmed. And, and Elk Island is part of the Beaver Hills. 
And from a wildlife standpoint, very well named because Amis Buche, which is the, I believe that's the Cree name for, someone will correct me, I'm sure, um, uh, for the Beaver Hills, because of all these smallish little pocket lakes and ponds, um, it created a, a tremendously valuable uh, area for beaver and of course influenced the establishment of Fort Edmonton not too far away that was on the uh, North Saskatchewan River. So maybe talk a little bit about why that area of central Alberta has all these little pockets and lakes and forests and it's very very lush. Yeah that's uh, it's such a beautiful area um, and it's what I like about El Elk Island National Park it's so close to Edmonton. And so people can see it on a day trip or they can go camping there for a while. But again, it's the glacial story. Edmonton was covered by three kilometers of ice. Elk Island was covered by three kilometers of ice. And the ice was, had what we call some ice streams. Some of it would flow really fast, maybe 100 meters, 200 meters a year. But that was on the side of Elk Island National Park. And that gave you smooth terrain. If you're from Sherwood Park or if you know Sherwood Park, that's some of that smooth countryside. East of Elk Island Park, um, if you go towards the Chipman in that area, it's really smooth. But Elk Island National Park, um, Beaver Hill Lake, uh, Beaver Hill Lake, Cooking Lake, Cooking um, Lake. Is all, was all built on a topographic high, probably 60 meters high, bedrock high. And then when the ice started to melt, a giant block of ice became stranded on that topographic high and it just nowhere to go. So it literally, I like to use the word rotted or stagnated in place. And so the ice is filled with debris, dirt, meaning clay, silt, sand, mud, and it, it's on the top. And then it starts to shuffle. It starts to shift and it goes like that. And eventually all the ice melted and we were left with this irregular topography created by that ever shifting dirt of which was clay, silt, mud, boulders. And that's what gives us the topography. And some of the last that we see in Elk Island National Park, rolling subtle hills. And in some instances, the last blocks of ice to melt left depressions. And those depressions are where we see some of the lakes today. And so the Beaver Hills, that's such an appropriate name for that area, uh, beavers. And we talked about the birds that lived there before, uh, the elk, the bison that they reintroduced there. That's kind of that topography, knob and kettle terrain. And maybe you're not from the Edmonton area. If you're from Calgary and you're driving south, let's say go to Claris Home and drive east a ways, all of where the windmills are, you're gonna come into another area where it's knob and kettle terrain. Um, we just went to see on the weekend, my wife and I, we went to the Medicine Wheel, Medicine Wheel Butte. And that's on this knob and kettle terrain there. So a similar story in various different places across the province. So we're, we're talking about small hills in central Alberta. Now let's talk about the opposite of small hills. Um, in the wintertime, you know, boy, the wildlife gets, gets pretty tough. You know, a lot of it takes off. Birding gets really tough. So, you know, a lot of the Alberta birders concentrate on owls. And really one of the great owls that we do spend a lot of time searching out in, in, in Alberta are snowy owls. And they like really flat, open places. Um, there's areas north, northwest of Edmonton in Mournville area that's really, really flat. And certainly areas um, between Calgary and, and Drumheller that are really flat, like as flat as you could draw on. And I know that that has a uh, post-glacial uh, uh, reason as well. And uh, so the snowy owls would not have been hanging out there 20,000 years ago. But tell us, what, what are we seeing when it's the flattest areas? So whenever I'm driving across the province, anywhere in the province, and I come across usually it's farmer's fields um, or nice flat pasture land, um, there's usually no stones there on the sides of the fields. And what those are, are the locations of old glacier lakes. So I want you to remember again, three kilometers of ice, Edmonton, further north, four kilometers, Calgary, a kilometer and a half of ice. Next time you go outside, look, look up and try and picture two kilometers of ice above you. Well, when that ice melted, something had to happen. Well, in various places across the province, 
we had these giant glacial lakes being formed up against the ice. We had topography, land surface to the one, one side, probably the south. We had the ice to the north and these lakes formed. And that's what gives you that, you know, Edmonton is so flat. And there's probably 15 meters of silt and clay in Edmonton, except where the river valley is. Go north to Morinville. That's an old glacial lake. On your way to Drumheller, some of those flat, flat, flat areas, glacial lake topography again. So it, it's again related to that glacial story and it creates that ideal habitat for the snowy owls that you just mentioned. Absolutely, that's so cool uh, that you, you're, you're birding on a, the bottom of a glacial lake. Uh, <laughs> let's let's, uh, let's uh, finish off here by going to the boreal forest. And it's great, I mean, we talk a lot about the boreal forest with the, 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 the huge lakes that are there, but perhaps the most important species of wildlife up there is the caribou. And it's in the news a lot and caribou one of the reasons why they're so endangered and quite frankly, you know, on the way out is because they are dependent on uh, fen and bog landscapes that are dominated by, by, by lichens, both arboreal and terrestrial lichens. Um, and these are fairly common in certain places in Alberta. Um, not a lot of things eat lichen. So, you know, traditionally the moose wouldn't get in there and there wouldn't be a lot of competition from other species. They, they do stuff that no other species can. They deal with snow very well. They deal with those conditions. Um, and they take advantage of these very inhospitable fen and bogs. I, I'm sure you've walked, I'm sure Sarah's walked through bogs. I've walked through bogs and they're, they're nasty because they're a wetland. They're a wetland with trees, and if you dug down a few inches, that would fill up with water instantly, and there's sphagnum, um, peat. Very interesting geology, very different from what we've been discussing. Very, very different. And I'm not even going to say the word glacial. Not very much anyways, mm -hmm. but a lot of the places where we have these fens, where we have these bogs, where we have these marshes, they're, you know, it's wet. And, and the water is flowing through them very, 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 very slowly. And peat is accumulating. Plants die, sink, peat accumulates. Well, why isn't the water draining away? Well, part of the reason is, is those where a lot of those fenlands and a lot of those bogs exist are where we have Cretaceous age. So rocks, I'm going to say 70 to 90 million years old at the surface and those were from old seas old oceans that occupied alberta at the time and so in northern alberta and in northwestern alberta we've got hundreds of meters of this marine shale marine mud rock mud doesn't drain very very well um, i said the north i said northwest you go to Fort McMurray area where we have caribou area as well. A lot of that fen and bog land is in that, in, is in that really poorly drained, ancient Cretaceous seaway material. And that's where I've seen it up in the town of Peace River on the Peace River, all those shales and the fens in there. Or as you go further west towards Grand Prairie, the same type of thing, same situation. There's more to it, but that's one good way to start and to think about it, Chris. I'm going to throw you a curveball because when I was very, very young, one of the first field jobs I ever had was to go to the Caribou Mountains. And I'm, I'm pretty sure most of the people listening here have never heard of the Caribou Mountains. It's, it's to the west of Wood Buffalo National Park. And it's, it's different from what we've been discussing because it's elevated. We took a, a float plane in and we landed, I believe, on Margaret Lake. And it was all stunted black spruce. And it was even permafrost. The only area, I think there may be an area near Zama that has permafrost as well. Now that's a different thing. And of course, it, because it's higher, you're essentially in the Arctic up there. So there's yeah. tons and tons and tons of, uh, of lichen. And it seems unusual because it's a bit of a rise in an area that I would have assumed that would have got the full brunt of the glaciers coming down, but still there's this, this, this plateau there. So, it's, it was preserved. It's what I call an erosional remnant. It's a piece of a landscape that existed, oh, 80, 90 million years ago. And I mentioned about ice streaming, moving along really quick, maybe a couple hundred meters per year. And when I say 100 meters per year streaming along, that's what I mean. It was the same thing up there. The ice went around these highlands 
and streamed along and they were preserved just like that upland that we talked a little while ago about a little while ago at Elk Island National Park. So it's the same thing. And I'd like to mention, I've been up there too in the Caribou Hills. <laughs> I was looking for diamonds. Hey, wow, wow. <laughs> yeah, the fly fishing was really good. It's yes. place I, I first caught, um, and the only time I ever caught um, grayling, Arctic grayling up, up in there. Um, the last talk, now we've been talking about all sorts of wildlife and geology, and I think there's a really neat connection because we've been to address a little bit of the grizzly bears and all this dynamic relationship between predators and prey and herbivores. And, and we're so fortunate here in Alberta to have intact systems, whether they're in the parks or not, that we do have these predator prey relationships and, and we see them, you know, we, we know of them, but we can see them in action in some of our national parks, places like Waterton Lakes, because it's so open. Um, oftentimes you do see some, some quite high drama between predators and prey that we are familiar with contemporarily. Yeah. But one of the differences between wildlife and geology is we don't tend to think of wildlife, you know, changing too much because certainly in our lifetime, the composition is, is, is pretty static. But in comparison to geology, you just go back a little bit in time and, and the predators and the species, they're all completely different, even though the, the landscape may have been relatively similar. And you tell a great story of um, an area down by the St. Mary's Reservoir, close to my hometown of Lethbridge, on Wally's Beach, where you came across a whole bunch of predators and prey, um, but none of them are still kicking around. Yeah, no, Wally's Beach, uh, every time, what's my favorite place to go? And I change my mind every day. But today, my favorite place to visit is going to be Wally's Beach. So Wally's Beach is on the, is a reservoir or on a reservoir along the St. Mary River um, in southwest Alberta, northeast of Waterton, southwest of Lethbridge. And you, the only time you can really go there, you go to Wally's Beach, they put, built a brand new campground. It's beautiful. But to see what we're going to talk about here, um, you go in late winter or early spring when the reservoir is low. So I recommend you check out the hydrographs that the Alberta government, the federal government have to watch for low water. And I'm just trying to do a, a water level curve because otherwise it'll be too high and you won't see it. What you've got there are mammoth tracks, woolly mammoth. You've got camel tracks. You've got horse tracks, musk ox, and you've got fossils. You've got bones of lots of those organisms. But you all, there's also what the archaeologists have reported is you've got stone tools from First Nations people, the first explorers to North America that were hunting these animals. And so they found butchered horse, they found butchered camel, and they found the tools that were used to butcher them. And then they found proteins on some of those tools, meaning tools, I mean axes and scrapers. They found proteins on them that they could relate to um, the horses and either camels or muskox. And they weren't sure on the latter two. So it's such a neat and interesting place to visit. So we've had, we've got mammoth, we've got camels. Camels originated in North America, became migrated around the world and became extinct. Horses, we had small horses. They became extinct and then the Spanish brought them to North America. Uh, muskox were this far south and others as well. And then there were scimitar cats, which uh, were related to the saber tooth cats. We found those there and the age of those hunt of, of, of when the early North Americans were hunting was 13,300 years ago. And all of those animals, we don't find in Alberta anymore. Why, Chris? Well, that's a, that's a, that's a, a pretty loaded question. Um, there's many factors, no doubt, that led to the extinction of, of these species. Uh, I mean, the landscape was not too different 13,000 years ago as it is today. We're not talking about continental drift back to the time oh. of the dinosaurs when not Alberta was down in Florida. The climate is all pretty similar. Um, there certainly was some climatic changes that occur and, and, and some people would say that they played a part because it contributed to some change. But, but certainly as your story suggests that the first peoples who came to North America or to South America or to Australia or to New Zealand 
hit the megafauna relatively hard. There is these new predators on the landscape and there does seem to be a trend worldwide that wherever people showed up, um, they, they, they hunted, of course, the, the, the largest animals, which, which would have the biggest uh, reward. And perhaps that had a, a part to play in combination with uh, climate change and, and other environmental factors um, that come to play as well. So, so I think that's a great story and it's a, perhaps a, a really appropriate way to, to end this first part of our discussion. In, in acknowledging the role that geology plays with wildlife and how both of those have really, for as long as people have been in Alberta, have influenced the way that Albertans view the landscape and view themselves and view their own lives. You know, it was very direct back in those early days, certainly with the saber-toothed cats and the, the woolly mammoths, but it still is very important to this day. And we see it, of course, uh, over the last couple of years with the amount of people um, going to our natural areas and feeling the sense of wonder in not only the wildlife, but the landscapes. And it really has informed the character of uh, the place that we call home. And it really is one of the reasons why we do call this place home. Yeah, I agree with you on that. You know, I, when we go out, we're always looking for places where nobody else is exploring. And when they're all crowded, and I get annoyed, but then I get annoyed and I think, no, I forget that. I said, no, they're getting out and enjoying nature just like I am. And I really do like mm -hmm. to see people exploring this province. And it doesn't matter what vehicle um, they do, you know, what their interests are. When I mean, when I say vehicle, it could be birds, it could be landscape, it could be art, whatever. So no, I agree. No, it's a beautiful community that is forming and it is making Alberta a very unique place in the world. There are very few places where these opportunities are so proximate I you know, an, an hour away um, from mm -hmm. everyone's home they can just be enriched by the natural world and we're happy to be making presentations to help people along yeah yeah i fully agree uh, thanks chris so sarah well, over to oh, you. this is amazing like uh, I, I mean, there's so I have so many ideas flowing through my mind after listening to your discussion. And, you know, one of the one of the things that really comes forward for me is the time scale of how we perceive our reality. So uh, in, in a previous life, I worked at the Tyrrell Museum and I was really struck with how the scale at which I considered Alberta was in the millions of years. And then as a wildlife biologist, the time scale in which I perceive Alberta, I mean, working with grizzly bears is maybe, it's maybe 20 years, <laughs> maybe 50 or 60. And what I had never really considered before, and I think the two of you have done a really great job in helping us understand is how that geologic time scale is actually responsible for creating the habitats that our current wildlife species are reliant on. And as we enter or continue to exist in this era of climate change, we start to see a lot of those habitats shift. And that really struck me when you were talking about pikas at the very beginning and how, and even rattlesnakes too, right? Like there's like these natural events that kind of change the availability of habitat like rock slides or you know, sinkholes are changing in the badlands with rain, but there's also this major shift of climate change happening at the same time. And I just wondered, I know, I know it's a very loaded, huge topic, but I just wondered if each of you could just speak for a few minutes about how climate change is affecting how you perceive the work that you do with the geology and the wildlife in Alberta. And I'll also at this time invite people to put uh, questions in the chat and I'll start moderating your questions as well. I would say that climate change operates on a different, and it, nobody's going to agree with it, not everybody will agree with me, it operates on a different scale than um, a lot of the geological processes we've been looking at. Being a geologist, one of the things I've seen and observed um, studying rocks around the world, as well as in Alberta, is climate is forever changing. It gets hotter, it gets colder, it gets drier, it gets wetter. And, and I, I take that perspective when I go exploring and sort of, you know, I've been in Alberta all of my life and you can see my gray hair. So, you know, that's been a long time. And, you know, I haven't, I've seen that the temperature has been rising some. And so that creates certain conditions, you know, some of the species that 
um, Chris might talk about. Maybe they're going to move north. Maybe they're going to move to the west. Uh, you know, that's kind of how I look at it. The time scale is just unbelievable. Climate change has always been, or climate has always been changing. Mm. And it's, it's going, we're going through it now um, quite dramatically. I don't know what's going to be the future. Uh, we're going to have to wait and see on that one. Chris. <laughs> Well, I, I, I can't really add too much, but you're certainly correct. You know, climate has always changed. And I think it's probably fair to suggest it's, it's changing a little bit more rapidly. And certainly in the field, you do notice that some species are taking advantage of it, even since the publishing of, of Birds of Alberta in 1998, which is 22 years ago. So I am also quite an older Albertan, though I have no gray hair. <laughs> oh, very um, good. Um, but, you know, many of the maps, for instance, uh, in that book, which were pretty accurate back in the late 90s, are no longer accurate mm -hmm. because in many cases we've seen the expansion of species. Uh, White-faced ibis may be the most dramatic example in the province. When we wrote um, white-faced ibis um, in 1998, uh, it was pretty much restricted to Pakauke Lake. Pakauke Lake is, is down where Dale showed... Um, uh, those sand dunes um, right down by many berries. And that's the only place they occurred in the province. And now they're all the way up through Edmonton, quite common. I get tweets, uh, well, I got several tweets this week about people seeing white-faced ibis way over in the province. So, you know, there, when you do study and you do start to under, to be able to read the natural landscape, particularly with wildlife and wildflowers, you get emotionally involved and you can start seeing changes. Um, we pro I'm certainly not equipped to be able to, to scientifically validate all the, 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 the observations that I make, but you know, you do see things, you do see things like the aforementioned caribou, which is a cold dwelling species. It needs snow. That's what it's all about. And there are many factors impacting caribou from, from obviously resource extraction, but also climate and, and folks up there and there's a bunch of stuff. So it is cumulative, um, but it is part of the discussion as well. I, I spend a lot of time working with younger people, millennials, and, and it is simply a part of their understanding how to perceive the world. It is, it is not frequently debated with them. It's just an acknowledgement that this is the path forward and we've got to manage with climate change in mind. And that is a generational change that I certainly see among younger people and not even so much with my, my generation as well. Yeah, I agree with that statement fully, Chris. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting trend. I think it affects not only how we perceive the world, but also it affects the scientific questions that wildlife biologists are asking, uh, or geologists even, like it affects how we do research on the landscape um, and how we start to understand how these changes happen over long or short periods of time. That kind of leads into our first question from Willem, who is talking about insect abundance. Um, and I've read some articles about how insect abundance is declining globally. And so Willem is saying that this summer he didn't see and hear many night hawks around their cabin in Pincher Creek area, but other summers there are many. And also he didn't see very many bugs in the air. And he's wondering if they stayed away because of the smoke or of the forest fires in BC, or if, but he's also saying in general, we see less bugs also in the Edmonton area. So uh, was the smoke from the forest fires affecting insect abundance or is that just a general declining trend uh, for other reasons? Well, there's, there's a, nature. The wonderful thing about nature is it's just tied to so many factors. So there's rarely just one, one simple tie-in, yeah. but there is no doubt that insect populations have declined even in my relatively you know, short period of driving around the province, boy, I had yeah. to clean my windshield a lot more than, than I, I, I do nowadays. I spent a lot of time in the prairies yeah. and, and used to have grasshoppers just coating um, your vehicle as you drove oh, through yeah. certain areas. And that's not nearly the way it is. Now there's a lot of contributing factors, but you know, there's no doubt that the, the, the efficiency of modern day pesticides um, they really 
it really takes things out. I, you know, in some of the work that I do, I do surveys in, in uh, cultivated croplands and there's just no bugs. Like they are really efficient at removing bugs mm-hmm. um, and insects, which of course, you know, feed and contribute to the ecosystem wealth that we have. And, and when you look at species like common nighthawks, which is a bug eating bird, um, things like barn swallows, very mm-hmm. common bird that's on every barn, but those are now listed as species at risk federally. Yeah. And, and many, many mm-hmm. bug eating birds are showing the steepest, what way am I going? Steepest declines, I'm going to hack, the steepest <laughs> declines that we have in Canada and are being listed. And yeah. there is pretty good long-term data from things like breeding bird surveys, which volunteers have been doing since the 1960s on the exact same routes, on the exact same days. So you've got pretty good uh, long-term data looking at the population declines and what is being seen as population declines in birds anyway, that are dependent on insects seem to be going down. Now, is it just a Canadian phenomena? These things do migrate down to Central and South America. There may be factors there as well. It's very complicated. And that's the wonder of nature is because it's hard to figure out and there's always questions to ask and there's always things to learn and I'm wrong all the time. And that's great. That's great. Uh, I, I love that. <laughs> Not that you're wrong all the time. Oh, but well, yeah. <laughs> but I, I think we are like as, as biologists and scientists, that is the whole entire point of science is to continue learning. And so that does mean that sometimes you're wrong because you learn something new and it changes how you perceive the world. Good perspective, um, yes. Dale, we've got a question here for you about, does the Lewis thrust go through the little Highwood Pass or through Highwood Pass? No. And also love your book. Ah, good, thank you. No, I can't answer that because I'd have to look at a map to see. But I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna tell you that um, when you're coming north on, I think it's Highway 40, um, off Highwood Pass, you keep going north, and you get to Mount Kidd. Mount Kidd is the northern termination. It's the end of the Lewis thrust. It's not thrust. The rocks have been folded and bent there, but it's where that 600 kilometer long Lewis thrust comes to an end. It goes down into Montana. Uh, Chief Mountain is on the Lewis thrust. So I can't answer your question. Is that, is that where it kind of veers off a little bit? The highway veers yeah. off and you kind of cut, go up and that's where you start getting cell coverage again. Yep. You kind of go up and over there, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. Um, there are also, I'll just say, there are a lot of comments in here from people who are loving this discussion and think that you two need to start a TV show and mm. they just love you. So I'll just, I'll just blanket that. <laughs> you're writing that in the chat. I'm not going to read it out loud. Pretty uh, funny. It's just a blanket. You, you're all well loved. Um, Chris, there's a question here. Uh, grizzly bears seem to be found only close to the Rockies. Has this always been the case or were they originally all over the prairies and then pushed west due to loss of habitat? Well, I think, Sarah, you could probably answer the question. So you're being very gracious <laughs> to throw it to me. Uh, when Lewis and Clark came across um, the United States after um, President um, Thomas Jefferson, who was a great natural scientist, um, said, hey, we need to know more about these things. Um, they were they first documented grizzly bears in a place called Poplar Creek, which I have stopped at, and that is in eastern Montana. So it's south of Grasslands National Park in yeah. Saskatchewan. It's way out there. So um, so so grizzly bears formerly occurred throughout the Great Plains, and why wouldn't they? There would have been there would have been bison and pronghorn and elk. And there'd be wolves killing things. There'd be First Nations killing things. Uh, there are certainly many roots. And there certainly would be areas that they would be able to hibernate. It'd be very interesting if they formerly dug into these prairie river valleys, um, slopes. And, and maybe there's historic grizzly bear dens dating back to, to the 18, 1900s. The last prairie grizzly bear, um, I believe, was killed not far from many berries, Alberta. I think we've mentioned many berries. Whenever we have nature talks, we, we talk about many berries a lot. There's a um, lot of cool stuff there. There's cool stuff. <laughs> and there's like 15 yeah. people in many berries. Um, <laughs> the abandoned church there used to have the skull of that 
plains grizzly bear on display with a couple of uh, dried flowers in it. And I think that was in the 1930s or something. And so they crept back where people weren't. Yeah. And now, as Sarah certainly can share, they're starting to expand, re-expand their range into places like the Milk River Ridge. Um, yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if they get to the Cypress Hills at some point in the future. Yeah. Um, but this is a very dynamic, difficult discussion about co-managing these species with ranchers and it's very convoluted, but it's a very yeah. interesting discussion for the 21st century. Yeah, it's also all about connectivity, right? Because obviously the landscape has changed a lot since prairies were out on the plains. So they tend to move through river valleys to go east. Um, but, you know, highways and farms and all kinds of industrial development and communities uh, definitely change what that landscape looks like as your grizzly bear walking across it. Um, but they have actually started to find grizzly bears in eastern Montana that are hibernating out on the grasslands again and spending 12 months of the year out on the grasslands. So um, as long as there can be coexistence between people who live on the grasslands and grizzly bears, um, it's very possible that they can start to reclaim some of that eastern range. Yeah, I have a question on grizzlies and either of you. So I spent part of my childhood growing up in Swan Hills and there was the Swan Hills grizzly. How is that related to the grizzlies that we know today? So there are still grizzly bears in Swan Hills. Um, mm, I can't remember what the latest population estimate is for Swan Hills. Do you remember, Chris? Like it's, it just came out. 30 I can't or 50 remember or what something. It's not huge, but it's not a lot. 30 or 50 or something like that. Yeah. Um, and part, but the Swan Hills is completely isolated from any other grizzly bear population in Alberta. And so part of the Alberta Grizzly Bear Recovery Plan right now is to try to find ways to connect that Swan Hills population mm. to other populations nearer to Hinton, further west. But I'm amazed that there are still grizzly bears around the Swan Hills. That's a pretty highly industrial impacted yeah. landscape. Um, and it just kind of shows <clears throat> how resilient bears actually are. <laughs> as long as you're not actively killing them, yeah. you know, they, they, they tend to do pretty well. They're around the White Court area. I've seen them around White Court. Yeah. White Court's not too far from the Swan Hills. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Definitely. So it's not like it's very far to go. It's just that there's a lot of roads and industrial yeah. activity separating those two things. Uh, we have a question here about erratics. How can you tell if you're seeing one? I think there's one in my neighborhood that was developed in the 1950s. So all an erratic is, is a boulder that's been carried from one place to another by the ice. Some people say it's got to go a certain distance. Some people say it doesn't have, you know, distance has got nothing to do with it. The ones we were talking about, Okotoks erratic, um, it came a thousand kilometers probably, uh, six, seven, yeah, we'll call it a thousand kilometers. It was transported a long ways. A lot of the pink boulders that we see in the prairies, mm -hmm. um, they're granites, they're granite erratics that were carried by the glacier and they came from the Canadian Shield in Northern Saskatchewan and in the Arctic. So how can you tell? You want to see if the nature of that rock, the characteristics of that rock are similar to the rocks in the city, right around that area. So I'm not sure where you're from, Monica, but if you were in Calgary, our local rocks are uh, the Pascapoo Formation. So you find these sandstones that we use for building stone. Um, if it looks like that, then it's probably not an erratic. But if it's a pink rock, a black rock, uh, could have came from the Canadian Shield. If it's a white to pink sandstone, maybe it came from uh, Oak, from Mount Edith Cavell. So, Give us some examples, Dale, of the rocks that you found just this week at the Medicine Wheel, because I often find it's a great story that these, again, it's a theme that we're sharing tonight, that the geology of, of teepee rings and medicine wheels represent a voyage of, of thousands of kilometers. Thousands of kilometers. So at the medicine wheel, so many of the stones um, that the First Nations people there used to build it are these pink granites, but there's black diorites. Um, and they came from the North Canadian Shield, let's say north of Prince Albert in Saskatchewan. But what I also found there, saw there this weekend, were these limestone rocks. And they come from 
stripper rocks, we probably have in eastern Saskatchewan, western Manitoba. And I find those really interesting. And when the rain and the snow and it melts and blows on it, they have interesting erosion patterns. So the white ones are, are, are limestones, carbonates. Yeah, he's growing lots of them. Yeah. Oh. I unmuted them. It's okay. Yeah, good. Yeah, I figured so. <laughs> uh, that's, yeah, it's so cool. The glacial erratics are, are just, it's so neat to think about the journey that a rock has taken over, not only over time, but over space to get to where it sits in your yard or uh, next to the road or whatever. Can I say um, something? Just let me, so story in a rock. So one of the things that I talk about from the glacial erratics from Mount Edith Cavell, I call it the story in a stone. And so if you go to the Okotoks erratic or the one at Head Smashed In Buffalo Jump or mm -hmm. wherever, and we've got these quartzites, they're about 500 million years old. North America was situated south of the equator at the time, hot, horrible. There were shallow seas and the sands there were transported by tidal currents, by tides, wave, tidal waves in this shallow sea. And this ocean was sinking, the basin was sinking. So at Mount Edith Cavell, there was a kilometer, a thousand meters of this sand deposited. Then it was buried probably 20 kilometers. And then mountain building brought those rocks up to the Earth's surface. And then the glaciers came. There was a landslide on the glacier. And then the glacier came to Calgary. The glacier came to Carstairs. The glaciers came to um, Head Smash in Buffalo Jump and dropped the stone. That's the story you can pull out of one of those giant boulders. So I took somebody else's question time, but I couldn't resist. No, it's very, it's very cool. Um, Dale and Chris, can you comment on the unique snails that live in the hot spring caves in Banff and how that relates to their unique geological setting? Boy, well, I know there's maybe Sarah, you, since you're, you're, it's your neck of the woods, the um, Cape and Basin hot springs um, has a, the word unique is, is thrown around a lot, but it, it's its own species and yeah. that's called endemic. So it's the only place in the world that it exists. Um, in order for a species to become its own species, it needs to be isolated by several factors. So that's why the Galapagos Islands was such a rich place and the Hawaiian Islands, because they're isolated. You don't have this cross fertilization of genes. It's, it's, a, it's a little central pool that is just breeding with itself and the changes that occur there make it sufficiently different to differentiate from others. So what must have happened is that that pool of warm water remained isolated from all others. So it likely may have persisted longer pre-glaciation, post-glaciation in order to, to sufficiently differentiate from the other pond snails, which they're clearly closely related to, but they're not that closely related to. So this particular snail in Alberta is on the Species at Risk Act and there's management plans and everything else for a lowly little snail. So next time you go to Cave and Basin, look down, see the introduced fish, look for rusty blackbirds yeah. and soras and look for a couple snails and there you might see the, the Banff spring snail. And the only thing I'd add to that is it's the temperatures, the unique temperatures that you, you mentioned that and the water starts to cool off as soon as it leaves mm -hmm. the springs. But it's also the chemistry associated with yeah. that water that helps to the uniqueness. So you've got temperature, uniqueness, isolation. You know, the chemistry, we've got limestones, calcium carbonates, a little bit of iron and sulfur in there, and it just makes it so unique. I remember there was a tourist there um, came maybe 10 years ago, and he was that individual was going to go in the ponds uh, because nobody was going to tell him he shouldn't do it. Well, they nailed him. The parks wardens got him something terrible. Yeah, it um, is. Uh, it is not a good idea to try to go and see them up close yeah. and personal. Uh, parks Canada really doesn't like that. And I think actually now with the renovations they've done to the Cave and Basin, I don't think you can even go into the area where there's uh, Banff Springs snails anymore. Oh. Um, One of my favorite stories from that area, just because we're throwing stories up. In February, I was there with the kids on the little boardwalk, and I saw a snake. In February, <laughs> in Alberta, there's a lot of little, it's a wandering garter snake. They're a fish-eating snake, and it just yeah. remained 
beneath the surface and it was nice and cozy it was a spa a non-wintering alberta snake only possible at the cave and basin hot springs geology yeah. and wildlife coming together again that is it is honestly one of the coolest and i think most underrated places in banff national park because everybody comes to the park and they want to go to the top of something to get the big views and obviously that's amazing but those trails in and around the cave and basin like that is actually a very unique wetland ecosystem in there and same with migratory birds in the spring it is crazy with birds that you can't really see easily anywhere else in the park so if you're a birder it is definitely a good place to go in the spring and before you go on let me give a shameless plug for my first book rocks ridges and river the scenic yeah. wonders of banff yoho and jasper national parks i've got a good section on um, the Banff hot springs and and how the warm water originates and where this where it comes from you know isotope chemistry they can tell how high the water originated from snowmelt and stuff so i encourage people to take a look at that that's so cool I, i'm gonna take a look at that that's yeah. that's such a neat idea uh monica has a question about magpies Oh I, no, it's yeah. always the magpie question that comes <laughs> up every time. I've been since 1998. Back then I had a flowing mane of wonderful hair and I've been doing CBC call-ins on birds since 1998 <laughs> and people calling in from all over the province about bird questions and there's always a magpie question. So this time the question is, I've heard that they are relatively new urban, urban birds. What did they do before coming into cities? Well, this is, I'm delighted to answer this one. Yeah, it's usually, I like this one too. Uh, Chris, how do I kill magpies? <laughs> and you know, I don't like that question, but this is no. a brilliant question. Okay, this is so magpies. Good. Magpies are very interesting. They're a generalist bird. We know that corvids, crows, jays are very intelligent birds, right? Um, and they are intelligent because they're curious, because they're social, because they do not fear new things. So they're very curious. And they can learn very easily because they are social. One bird figures something out and it's yeah. shared among the troop. And they are not tied to a very specific habitat. So out on the prairies prior to, to European settlement, they'd be probably hanging around, well, the First Nations communities, of course, but also on their own taking, you know, scavenging and just being opportunistic, mm -hmm. being very opportunistic. And suddenly, landscapes changed, but the opportunity to take advantage of 21st century people was an opportunity that they could adapt to very quickly because they are programmed within their DNA. Unlike other birds, owls couldn't adapt. An owl can do just one thing. We all think they're wise. They're not wise. They do one thing. Yeah. They, they pounce on mice. That's it. They can't do anything else. But, but magpies can, you know, they can unlock your garbage. They can eat a bird nest. They can tease your cat. They can squawk. They can do anything. So yeah. the advantage that general opportunistic species have, while not tremendously sexy, really allows them to take advantage of changes in the environment. And that ties into a little bit what we've talked about before. Whereas many birds can't do that because they're just too specialized. Yeah. I went on a field trip when I was in undergrad university and we were talking about magpies. And I had a theory on their origin in, North America. And I said they were brought as pets by Sir Thomas Mag, who came from Great Britain. Um, nobody believed me. <laughs> They're also, in fairness, very beautiful. And to yeah. be honest, I know a lot of people have a little bit of a hate on for magpies, but I think they're gorgeous. The way that their feathers are so iridescent. And in the wintertime, there's so few birds that are out and about and doing things. And I actually really like seeing magpies just squawking around and teasing my dog, I think is really funny. Um, question here about caribou. Uh, what may be the future of mountain caribou in Alberta? Uh, when I worked with the Canadian Wildlife Service for John Stelfock in the early 70s, there was optimism. Yes, I'm old. <laughs> Well, again, I'm not the best to to answer. This is again a very tough question. These species, yeah. for the most part, are found uh, only in Jasper National Park in Wilmore, 
uh, and up through Grand Cache. So yeah. mountain caribou are a subspecies of woodland caribou, and we don't have many within everyone's lifetime, I'm sure, tuning in here. We've seen the loss of mountain caribou in Banff National Park. Yeah. Uh, about 20 years ago, an avalanche took out the last numbers, but that's what happens when you get smaller and smaller numbers. When I was a, a kid just starting out, I photographed and saw mountain caribou in the Moline Valley uh, up by uh, Moline Lake, up on the Bald Hills, I think they're called, uh, something like that. Yep. Um, and saw their diggings as, you know, 20 years ago, I would see their diggings. Now that population is pretty much gone. I've, I've seen and photographed mountain caribou down on Beauty Flats, close to the, the, um, the, uh, the Icefields Parkway. And when you do that drive, you'll see signs, mountain caribou signs, beware of mountain caribou signs. Mm -hmm. And it's very telling because those signs are poor and faded. Mm -hmm. And so too are the prospects of those species. And again, that population down along the Icefields Parkway is, is down to a dozen or something. You can look it up line. Uh, there's one in the Tonquin Valley that's down to a few dozen. And then the northern part of Jasper, it's, it's down to a few dozen as well. It, it has to do with climate change. It has to do with, with, with people and access. It has to do with an increased population of white-tailed deer and moose, which increases the amount of predators that these things <laughs> face. So it's a cumulative thing that is facing caribou. And there is a huge tide working against their future. Um, there are a lot of very intelligent, good people trying to find solutions, maternal dens, maternal pens, sorry. So um, mm -hmm. breeding caribou, and you could breed caribou. The Laplanders have been breeding caribou for yeah. you know, 5,000 years. Yeah. It's, it's not a hard thing. They're called reindeer up there, but it's essentially the same species. So we have to ask ourselves as a society, or, or will we be happy with, with penned reindeer running around our national parks? Or are we going to fight to keep them present where they are? Or are we happy if, if we lose and learn a story from them? Yeah, I, I mean, you're right. That's the question that we're faced with. And the, I think also the important thing to remember is that we can pen and rear caribous in, in a pen, but if we don't have habitat to release them to, we are basically um, condemning them to a life in captivity, uh, even if it's a big pen and it's like a natural space, if we don't have the habitat to send them back to. And so that's why habitat is as much an issue as the actual animals themselves and their reproductive rate and all that is where, where do they live? Where can they live where it's a safe place and resources are abundant? And sadly, that space is, is running out. Does Edmonton still do insecticide spraying with helicopters? Do, you, do either of you know that? I, I didn't even know that Edmonton was using insecticides with helicopters. I cannot answer that. Willem lives there, so I would think he might know. Yeah, Mike Jenkins is the guy that runs the mosquito control program, but um, I'm not, I, I don't know the answer how they apply. It's an interesting question. Yeah. Um, oh, got a question here about the feral wild horses in oh, Sundry. No. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> oh, actually, it's more of a comment. I visited okay. west of Sundry to see the feral horses there a few years ago in June. The horses were wonderful. This is a managed forest area. There were no insects, not a dragonfly near water, no mosquitoes, etc. It was bizarre. <laughs> um, yeah, it is bizarre. The, uh, the wild horse, feral horse discussion in Alberta is the most emotional right? conservation <laughs> issue in the province yeah. um, because of the romanticism involved with horses naturally. So people feel very strongly on both sides of the issue. I only wish we could engender that level of passion for, for grizzly bears and caribou. If we did, um, the politicians and the decision makers mm -hmm. would listen up a little bit more. You know, it's interesting, the feral horses, I would spend a fair amount of time in Australia, we did pre-COVID. They have the same discussions in Australia about the feral horses and the damage that's done to the landscape and should we do something. It's almost identical as here. So I find that very interesting. Mm 
Yeah, and I, um, I'm going to start wrapping up now, uh, but I do just want to, there was somebody who is uh, it's saying thanks for my comments about Habitat because he works with Indigenous caribou, and I just want to also close the same way we started by recognizing that today is Truth and Reconciliation Day, and as one of these new tools is this Indigenous Protected Conservation Area, these IPCAs, and so these are new forms of protected areas that are being applied across Canada that are developed in partnership with Indigenous groups um, and really are reconciliation in action, I guess you could say, because it is a co-management idea where Indigenous groups work with land managers and apply traditional knowledge and long-term understanding of the landscape to manage these conservation areas with an Indigenous lens that weaves together Indigenous knowledge with Western science for the benefit of wildlife um, and, and water and all of the things. And, and they're very cool. And if you haven't heard of IPCAs, please look into it because I think it is the new uh, protected area tool for all of the wildlife that we've learned about here today. And this interface, I will never go out into the forest and um, and see how geology and wildlife, I will always look at these mountains a little bit differently now because all of our habitat has been created over thousands of years of rocks moving around and soils pushing and <laughs> all of the things. So I want to uh, thank Chris and Dale again for amazing presentation and amazing discussions. Thank you so much for your time and for your expertise. Everybody loves you. Uh, myself included. Have a wonderful evening.